Hello everyone, I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will be talking about approach to a case of hypokalemia. Hypokalemia or low serum potassium is defined as a serum potassium less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. It is a relatively common phenomena in our hospitals and abnormalities result in a tenfold increase in hospital mortality. The causes of hypokalemia may be due to decreased intake and this is because of starvation or clay ingestion. Hypokalemia may also be caused due to redistribution into the cells. Causes of redistribution we will see later in this presentation. And finally, it can be because of increased loss. Redistribution into cells is an important cause of hypokalemia. This is a schematic diagram of a cell and this is potassium entering it. Once potassium is into the cell, there is reduced level of potassium in the extracellular fluid and this results in hypokalemia. The most common cause of redistribution into cell is the acid base abnormality and most commonly metabolic alkalosis. Also possible is hormones and drugs as we will see in a minute and finally anabolic distribution. Hormones and drugs which cause hypokalemia are alpha antagonists, thyrotoxic periodic paralysis, theophylline and caffeine. Theophylline most commonly used in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease but its use is now being questioned because of its adverse effect on the heart. Insulin and increased beta adrenergic activity both can cause hypokalemia. Anabolic redistribution into the cell may be because of vitamin B12 and folate supplementation. It may be because of granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factors given in the setting of hematopoietic stem cell transplant or patients having received induction chemotherapy for acute leukemia. And total parenteral nutrition can also cause redistribution of potassium into the cell. Increased loss of potassium can be because of a renal loss or a renal cause and a non-renal cause. Non-renal cause is most commonly from the gastrointestinal system and because of sweating. We will now look at renal causes of hypokalemia. The most important is increased distal flow and distal sodium delivery and this can occur because of diuretics. Many of our patients on diuretics may develop hypokalemia and diuretics must al always be considered as a prime cause for hypokalemia. And salt wasting nephropathies, relatively rare in clinical practice. Increased secretion of potassium can cause hypokalemia and magnesium deficiency as we will see later and this fact has treatment implications. The clinical features of hypokalemia may be cardiac, so the patient can have atrial or ventricular arrhythmias. The patient can have skeletal manifestations in the form of a myopathy or rhabdomyolysis. And finally, the patient can have a gastrointestinal manifestation in the form of paralytic ileus. A diagnostic approach to hypokalemia begins with establishing that the patient does in fact have a serum potassium of less than 3.5, following which we have to ascertain if the situation is an emergency. If it is an emergency, we must move to therapy immediately. Although not routinely seen in clinical practice, we can also evaluate the patient for pseudo-hypokalemia, in which case no further workup will be required. As in all cases, a detailed history and physical examination is Ill invaluable to proper diagnosis and if there is cl clear evidence of low intake, then we can treat and evaluate accordingly. If we know that there has been a transcellular shift, then we can treat accordingly as well. If these investigations and possibilities have been ruled out, then we can go in for a urine potassium. Now, urine potassium is an important part of the diagnostic evaluation of hypokalemia. And if the urine potassium is over a period of 24 hours, less than 15 millimoles, then it is because of a non-renal or extra-renal cause and we must assess the patient's acid-base status. If the patient is acidotic, then he is having diarrhea and he is losing bicarbonate in the uh, stool. As a result, uh, there is also extra-renal loss of potassium causing metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. If the patient's acid-base status is normal, then he has had uh, increased sweating and may have participated in a 
athletic activity historically if the patient is alkalotic then this may be because of a diuretic use or because of vomiting if the patient's urine potassium over a period of 24 hours is more than 15 millimoles per day then this is because of a renal cause now it is important to understand that it is the job of the kidney to conserve potassium if it is unable to do its job of conserving potassium thereby lo uh, causing loss of potassium in the urine the patient will have hypokalemia and will also show uh, increased urine potassium once we have ascertained that the hypokalemia is because of increased renal loss we have to look at what is called the transtubular potassium gradient or TTKG this is an index or it reflects the amount of uh, potassium the body is willing to conserve through a gradient across the tubules if the TTKG is less than 2 this means that there is increased tubular flow or osmotic diuresis however if the TTKG is high then there is an issue with distal potassium secretion and at this point we have to look at the patient's blood pressure and volume status if the patient's blood pressure and volume status is low or normal then we can again look at the patient's acid base status if the patient is acidotic then we can arrive at the conclusion of proximal renal tubular acidosis diabetic ket ketoacidosis and drugs like amphotericin B and acetazolamide if the patient is alkalotic then we can consider a urine chloride if the patient's blood pressure is high uh, and or is in a state of fluid overload then we must look at the aldosterone now I want to remind the viewers that we have reached here after we have ascertained that the patient's TTKG was more than 4 and before that the patient's 24-hour urine potassium was more than 15 millimoles per liter. Moving on, so if the aldosterone is high then we can think of a hyperreninemic state such as renin secreting tumors. If the aldosterone is low but still the patient is having a high blood pressure or is in a state of fluid overload then we must consider the cortisol axis we will now discuss the ECG changes in hypokalemia this is the normal ECG and patients with hypokalemia can have a decreased T wave voltage as seen here they can also have a prominent U wave denoted by this arrow Hypokalemia can also cause a peaked P wave and there can also be ST depression. Eventually, the T wave will disappear leaving only the U wave. The next ECG, this one, shows a transition between the T wave and the U wave. The T wave will eventually disappear leaving only the U wave. Treatment of patients with hypokalemia is generally oral and forms the mainstay of therapy. Magnesium replacement may be required for refractory cases and you must understand that when the body stores diminish by 100 milliequivalents or 100 millimoles, the serum potassium drops by 0.27. However, this fact is rarely relevant from a clinical perspective. The peripheral line can replace 20 to 40 milliequivalents per liter, whereas the central line can replace up to 80 milliequivalents per liter. And finally, we will give intravenous potassium if the patient is unable to take orally, has paralysis or arrhythmias. Finally, whom to treat and when? If a patient is asymptomatic and has a serum potassium of less than 3, then supplementation is recommended. However, if the patient is high risk with heart failure, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease or is taking digoxin or is having liver disease or having mild or moderate hypertension, then we can consider a potassium, serum potassium target of 4 milliequivalents per liter. That's all for this presentation on hypokalemia. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.